Welcome to Voices of Experience. I'm Dan Michael, President Emeritus of the Minnesota State Retiree Council, AFL-CIO. And today we'll be talking with our good friend, Steve Francisco, uh, Federal Policy Director of the Minnesota Council of Nonprofits. And today's topic is the 2010 Health Care Reform Act. Steve, uh, why are we talking about th this new health care reform law today? Is, is it a, a big deal? It is a big deal, Dan. Actually, when you think about some of the big pieces of legislation that Congress has passed uh, during the country's lifetime, this is going to rank up there as one of the big ones. It's right up there with the creation of Social Security in 1935 and Medicare in 1965, Medicaid. And so because health care affects literally everybody in America, it is a big deal. Okay. Now let's put this law under, under a microscope. And, and see, see what's going on in, inside of it. Uh, it's always a temptation to talk about the politics of, of, of the health care bill, but we'll leave that for the uh, cable talk shows and, and, and the Sunday morning TV talk shows, and we'll just focus on the core of the uh, Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act, mm -hmm. as it is officially known. And uh, in, our, in our little chat today, we'll, we'll, talk, we'll deal with four, with four parts. Uh, which part of the Health Care Reform Act goes into effect when, because there are different different timelines, and, and how does the this Health Care Reform Act affect r retirees? And then third part, other major components, and then, and then a word uh, about some legal changes or challenges. Uh, mm -hmm. So I think we will we'll have a, a good 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 program today. Let, let's start with the timelines, okay? Uh, as I said, there are in different years, different parts of this uh, act go into effect. Uh, what goes into effect right now, uh, 2010? Well, the first part of this new law actually went into effect on April 1st, and uh, that was a state option for states to do what's called early expansion of Medicaid. Many of our viewers are probably aware that one of the key parts of this bill is an expansion of eligibility for Medicaid for people with incomes up to 133% of the federal poverty level. That works out to a little over $27,000 a year in income for a family of four people. And states can use this option to expand Medicaid early, but they also have to put up the state matching share, the traditional mm -hmm. matching share of 50%. It's not clear, for example, that Minnesota is going to be able to do that uh, because of our current budgetary problems, but that was the first piece of this to take effect. Second piece to take effect is a requirement that insurance companies can't discriminate against children with pre-existing medical conditions, and by 2014, that ban on discrimination for pre-existing medical conditions extends to everybody. And then finally, the other thing that's created immediately is a temporary high-risk pool for people who don't have insurance who haven't been able to get insurance because of pre-existing conditions. That pool will carry through until 2014 when the state-based exchanges are created and when the full expansion of Medicaid takes effect for everyone. Okay, now 2011, now what, what happens uh, as far as the dr drug makers and health insurance companies? Right, well in 2011 there are gonna be a series of new excise fees and taxes uh, particularly on the pharmaceutical companies and on the insurance companies to help pay for this bill. You know, the cost of this bill came in just under, or just, just slightly around a hundred, uh, or around one trillion dollars over the first ten years. To pay for that bill, it was necessary to levy a series of excise taxes and fees. And so Congress uh, has decided that they're going to impose some of these on drug makers and insurance companies. They, they are the ones making the money off, off that the That is film. correct. Yeah. Okay, we got 2010, 2011, uh, 2013 uh, for, for wealth, wealth, wealthy Americans and medical device manufacturers. Right. Well, in 2013, there's going to be an increase in the Medicare payroll tax, an increase of almost 1%, 0.09%. Um, which will raise the Medicare tax to 2.35% on wages, but only for people, for individuals making incomes of $200,000 or more, oh. or for married couples making $250,000 or more. 
That is not the vast majority of the American public. Vast majority of working Americans are going to see no increase in the Medicare payroll tax. But this is really significant because it helps pay for this bill and it also extends the solvency of the Medicare trust fund by approximately a decade. And that's according wow. to the nonpartisan Congressional Budget Office. Okay. So 2014 is a very important year. Right. And, uh, or 2013. Uh, 2014 is also a very important year and several items kick in. Uh, right. The big one that kicks in in 2014 is the individual mandate requiring most individuals to have qualified health insurance coverage on that date. And that's also when we see um, the state-based insurance exchanges, which are basically marketplaces where you can shop for different insurance policies that meet your individual need. Those are supposed to be up and running by 2014. On a, on a health exchange, you know, would a person go in on a, on a, on a computer and, and, and see different plans or? It's not exactly clear the, all the details yeah. of what the exchanges are going to look like. And in fact, the Department of Health and Human Services is right now in the process of drafting rules for what, what the plans are going to ha have to offer mm -hmm. at a minimum. There's going to be a minimum base package of benefits mm -hmm. for all of the plans in the exchange. But because you're going to have so many insurance companies offering so many different products, the expectation is that you're going to have competition among yeah. those insurance carriers to offer more benefits at a more affordable cost for the consumer. To me, that sounds a little bit right now of uh, Medicare Part D, the prescription drug coverage, uh, whereas uh, I call the uh, uh, sen senior linkage line uh, from, from, the, from the Board of Aging of the state of Minnesota. And then I tell them what, what uh, prescriptions I, I take and they have a computer program and they say, well, here, here are the three lowest companies uh, mm -hmm. for, for what for what you you need. Mm -hmm. yeah. So that's a, that's an exchange of sorts, and mm -hmm. uh, because there are 40, 50 companies out there, or right. or, or plans out there, and uh, I, you know, it, it narrow, narrows down to three for me, and uh, and I'm free to do whatever I want. I can, right. I don't even have to take from the bottom three if I, if, right. if, if I don't I want to. I should add too about the state-based exchanges. Um, mm -hmm. This law actually allows Minnesota and other states latitude to join with other states. Mm -hmm. And in fact, State Representative Tom Huntley of Duluth, who's also a physician and chairs the uh, health uh, finance division in the Minnesota House of Representatives, he said recently he would favor Minnesota looking at possibly combining with several other upper Midwestern states, which have traditionally mm. had low Medicare costs, but also deliver good health care services and creating a basically an upper Midwest regional pool of several states, which could have the advantage of having a larger population base, spreading the risk further, and also having more leverage in dealing with the insurance companies that would participate in that exchange, getting them to offer more benefits mm -hmm. at more competitive